Hello and welcome to the Digital Craft Festival. Today I'm joined by makers from Craft Festival Bobby Tracy as part of our Digital Year of Endangered Crafts. My name is Daniel Carpenter from the Heritage Crafts Association and the theme for this conversation is Endangered Craft Skills. I'd now like to introduce our makers. They are Nick Hand, a letterpress printer from Bristol, Rebecca Struthers, a watchmaker based in Birmingham, and then we've got three craftspeople based in Devon, Sharif Adams, a pole lathe bowl turner, Beth Gerald, a reverse glass sign painter, and John Williamson, a Devon stave basket maker. Hi everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, before I ask each maker to say a little bit about themselves, I'll just give a little background about endangered crafts. So in 2017, the Heritage Craft Association published the first edition of its Red List of Endangered Crafts. Uh, and this was the first research project of its kind to map traditional craft skills by the likelihood that they will survive the next generation. In 2019, we published the second edition, which looked at 212 crafts and showed that 36 of them were critically endangered, meaning that they were at serious risk of no longer being practiced. A further 71 were considered endangered, meaning that while they currently had sufficient craftspeople to transmit the craft skills to the next generation, there were still serious concerns about their ongoing viability. Last year, we were invited by the Craft Festival in Bobby Tracy to run a yurt of endangered crafts uh, with the yurt supplied by Yurts for Life. And Nick, Sharif and I took part with a number of others uh, to talk to the general public about the importance of safeguarding craft skills. Uh, we were due to come back this summer with an even bigger yurt, but the coronavirus intervened so instead, we've decided to bring some of the demonstrators to you online to talk a little bit about what they do. Uh, so if it's OK with Nick, I'll hand over to him to say a little bit about his work and the things he's uh, focusing on at the moment. Nick. Thanks, Daniel. So um, as you said, we're letterpress printers. We're based uh, right in the middle of Bristol, about 100 metres from um, where Colston's uh, statue used to be until Sunday. And um, um, and uh, Bristol was uh, a printing centre, a left press print, printing centre up until about 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. And it would have had um, up to um, 15,000 people working in um, letterpress or um, crafts and skills trades connected to letterpress. So let's, our form of letterpress printing is the form of printing that Gutenberg invented in Mainz in 1450 um, using uh, lead type. Um, well, he used lead type, but we use lead type and wood type. Um, and it, it basically disappeared in Bristol, um, as I say, like 40, 40 years or so ago. Um, I trained as a typographer, um, a, a sort of an old fashioned art school, a classic art school, um, people sort of tell me that um, you spend all your life recreating the place you were happiest in. And I think I've done that with our print shop. So I've kind of recreated my art school print shop here uh, over the last 10 years. Um, for me personally, my interest in letterpress printing came about through um, doing a journey around the coast of Britain 11 years ago. And on that, uh, it, was a, it was a kind of six, six and a half thousand mile journey on my bicycle because I went around Ireland as well. Um, and, well, only, I actually only went around Ireland because someone told me you can't say you went around the British Isles unless you go around Ireland. So I had to, I had to do an extra 1600 miles cycling around Ireland. But on that journey, I met 130 Maker, so I set out to make little films of people that made stuff by hand who lived on the coast. Um, and I used a still camera and um, a little digital audio recorder. I edited the little films in my tent every night and put the films up on the website the next day. Um, and what that did, it gave me like um, sort of massive appreciation of those people really. And when I came back, it took me four and a half months. Um, I came back to Bristol and um, I gave up working on a computer, although um, I am what, clearly on a computer at the moment. But, um, and, and I wanted to go back to 
um, working with uh, type again, wood type and lead type. So I, I spent the next couple of years seeking out um, printing presses, type, some things I would buy until I ran out of money and then lots of things got given to me because, you know, some of, I'm sure some of you know that after a while people kind of hear of you and say, oh, I've got my dad's old printing press in the garage. Would you come and have a look at it? And you end up carrying a, um, you know, um, half a ton printing press um, to a small van at the end of the lane. Um, and... Um, so that's what that's what we do and and um the uh, left press printing has become sort of popular again maybe like some of the other crafts here um in that we run workshops um or we'll have run workshops up until the middle of march and um you know people are people really enjoy learning um learning how to set type and how to print type and we have um about 15 printing presses um and they range from i've got two albion presses in this room one the oldest one is from 1830 um and it's incredible um because it was made before there were bicycles on the road and there were no cars on the road and it came from two streets away from where i am now just the other side of the Colston, where the Colston statue was, um, and uh, and it works as well as the day it was made. So they're incredible um, pieces of equipment, um, very beautiful. In fact, I might show you um, the 1831 Albion Press. You can see it there, and there's a small one in the background. Um, <laughs> this is this isn't the print shop. The print shops across the way. Um, anyway, that's what we do, and that's why um, you know why um, I got to do this um, kind of weird thing. I'll show you some wood type because just because you said to show us some things. So this is some wood type for a little poster that I'm making. Uh, this is um, boxwood. It's made from boxwood. It's gill sands. I've got a whole cabinet full of gill sands wood type, and Eric Gill. The first time Gill Sands was ever used was in Bristol. Eric Gill came and painted a shop front of a publisher halfway up Park Street, which is um, about half a mile away. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a nice sort of local connection with Gill Sands as well. Um, I feel like I'm rambling on, so I should hand, hand back to you, Daniel. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and I think it's interesting that you've shown us the type there, because I think that's one of the reasons that letterpress has ended up on the red list of endangered crafts. It's the fact that this type has, has become dispersed around the country, and often it's been em employed for things that are kind of outside its intended use for interior decoration and things. So it's been harder and harder to come by. Is that, is that right? Uh, that is right, yes, yeah. Because um, the, the crafts that uh, end up on the red list is for a number of reasons, whether it's passing on the skills or whether it's uh, supply of materials and equipment. Um, and that's an interesting example. Okay, so uh, maybe we'll go to Rebecca now to say a little bit about uh, what you do and anything you're involved with at the moment. Rebecca? So um, I'm a watchmaker, restorer and a historian. And um, I suppose I, I got into it quite by accident in many ways because uh, I don't often meet many other watchmakers, particularly in the UK. Um, I think now we think of watchmaking as being Swiss, probably. Um, but if you go back to the, the 17th and 18th centuries, watchmaking, the, the centre for watchmaking was the UK. And it's only been over the last few hundred years that we've really lost that reputation for fine watchmaking in the UK, which... I think it's been a combination of a few factors from economic factors, but also a um, situation now with a lot of things being done by automated machinery and CAD. So um, we're kind of losing the skills in that sector in quite a big way. Um, so that for me was a really important way that I got into it was um, through jewellery and silversmithing initially. Um, I spent a couple of years training in jewellery and just there happened to be a watchmaking course at the university I was at. So I found it completely by accident and um, switched courses after a few years and um, yeah, found horology. 
which for me, I think it was just the perfect fusion of art, science, engineering, history. It's, a, it's such a diverse subject. It covers so many bases and is constantly challenging, which I love. But um, yeah, I, I started out in restoration and I think that for quite a few master watchmakers now has been such a valuable way of getting into the industry because there are so few training opportunities to learn how to do things the old school way um, that working on things that are hundreds of years old is a brilliant way of gaining that experience making things because there's no spare parts supply. You have to make everything from scratch or, or you know, the watch will never run again. So um, that's how me and my husband, Craig, uh, now run a workshop together. We both started out um, on restoration. I specialize in watches made um, 18th century is my kind of peak era, but I go for anything from sort of 1600 up to about 1820. And then Craig specializes in slightly later. So 1820 up to 1960, which is kind of as modern as we go. Um, so yeah, that's how we got into it and it was through uh, restoration that we kind of reached a point that we realised we could make virtually every component for other people's watches. So we decided to have a go at making our own and that's where we are at the moment now. We're hopefully going to complete towards the end of this year, touch wood, providing um, there aren't too many more delays with the, obviously the virus situation. But uh, we're now working from home in our potting shed, which is uh, quite good fun. Challenging, small, but fortunately watches are very small, so it's quite an easy thing to scale down. And um, yes, I'm also writing a book. So that's going to be uh, the plan is to print in 2022, and it's on the history of horology told through watches. So it's very much looking about the history of time and our relationship with it and these beautiful devices that we've invented to measure something that is a natural phenomenon completely outside of our control. And um, I think for me, part of the reason I love watches so much is because they're such personal objects that we keep on our body and are so close to us. And until very recently, when we now obviously we now have phones and computers, they were our only way of knowing accurate time on the move. So they were very, very important. And they fed into everything from kind of our social and cultural politics through to literal politics. They had influence in things like gender, race, um, and class. So it's kind of using the watches to, to, as I suppose, as an introductory point to look at the, the world they were in and the role that they played to us at that point, um, all through this one tiny little ticking thing that would fit in the palm of your hand. So yeah, that's what I, I've been busy doing at the moment when I'm not able to be watchmaking. The potting shed is very small, so it's kind of one in, one out with me and my husband at the moment. But uh, yeah, so that's that's I think where we are at the moment. And uh, yeah, now I'm probably rabbiting. So. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I should say that you were really helpful in putting together the watchmaking entry for the red list because you you helped us survey the the watchmaking sector or uh, the the extent of it in the UK. And no, that was really helpful. I was just going to ask about um, the current original piece you're working on. Was that a customer commissioned it from you or is it something that you created from, an, from your own idea? Well, um, it's kind of, it's something we wanted to do. We just got to the point where we really wanted to, it's like the ultimate challenge for any watchmaker before you can really call yourself a master watchmaker, you have to make your own watch from scratch. So it's kind of something we wanted to do anyway. And we've got a few clients that we've been doing restoration work for or recommission movements um, and turning <coughs> vintage movements back into watches again. And um, we basically managed to get enough interest to get five customers to come on board and commission them before they were made, which is very brave and I'm very grateful for them for doing that. Um, so yeah, it's um, a technique that was used before by a watchmaker called Brede at the turn of the 19th century um, as France was recovering from the revolution. He uh, developed something called subscription watches where you had to put down a hearty deposit on the watch to pay him to make it and um, it allows him to kind of rebuild his business. But uh, yeah, so it worked for him and it's currently working for us. <laughs> Such mm -hmm. wood. As long as nothing drastic happens with um, the virus, we're on track for this year. Well, I'll, uh, I'll put your website link up in the description so that uh, you can hopefully get some more more uh, customers in future, which would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, should we move on to Sharif? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment. Yeah, hi, Daniel. So um, I am a traditional um, wood turner. So I don't use an electric lathe. I use a traditional lathe called a pole lathe, which doesn't require any energy at all. Um, and I make wooden bowls, I make plates and cups, really simple things that people use every day for eating from. Um, I carve spoons occasionally, but I'm doing a lot less of that now. I'm really specializing in bowls um, and turned boxes as well. I've got a few here. So these, these are the bowls, sort of bowls that I turn. These are turned from beach. I turn them while the wood is still very green. So I get logs delivered to my workshop now and um, they sit outside my workshop just just outside in, in the in the weather and I wait until the bark's just beginning to peel off usually until it's at its best but I can start using it when it's green. So these bowls because they're turned green with quite a high moisture content as they dry they warp slightly and you can see that they're not completely round they start perfectly round, but they, they sort of move a little bit as they dry. Um, and I make little cups and things like this, little wooden cups. And these are the boxes that I turn, which are um, a very ancient form of box, which were turned a lot in countries like Northern Europe, Sweden, Scandinavia. Um, and they have a, a clever little locking mechanism on the lid which is an interesting tricky bit of turning and a so sort of, I don't know if you can see that like a little rebate on the in the box so the lid fits in there twists and then the lid locks in place and these these were churned out in their thousands by craftsmen in Sweden this is a multi-locking lidded um, box so you can turn these with multiple sections that all lock into each other like that and I offer these for sale through my website through commission people commission me to make stuff mostly bowls and plates but very recently what I've been doing more than anything else and I think it's as partly as a result of the um, the situation the C19 situation lots of people being at home I've got tutorials on the um, on YouTube videos that I've made telling people how to how to begin a sort of tutorial so people who've never turned a bowl before. I've got plans on my website so somebody can build themselves a lathe quite easily and then um, learn to turn bowls on the lathe. So I've been getting lots of requests for the tools because it's something else I do. These uh, they're called hook tools. This is one that's used for hollowing a cup. It's got a slight crank in it. And they're, they're very simple tools. I've got a small uh, barrier's anvil and a forge in my workshop. And I draw out a section. This is one for turning the lock and lid of boxes. There, there's all sorts of shapes and sizes of these tools um, for de various different projects. But I've been very busy making these for sale for people from all around the world. I've been posting to places as far as Australia and all around Europe and America. Um, so yeah, since I've been doing that anyway for the last few years, selling tools, but the last um, month or two, I've been doing that more than anything else. I haven't really turned anything on the lathe. I've just been making tools because people have got more time on their hands, I guess, and they're they're giving it a go. You know, doing something they've not tried before. Um, so yeah, as well as that, I do teach. Obviously, most of my income, probably the last few years, has come through teaching rather than selling. Um, and obviously none of that's been happening at all recently because of the, the situation that we're in. But I, um, um, I teach at some of the big major green woodworking events around the country. Uh, there's the Pole Lathe Turners Association called the Bodgers Ball. It's a weekend of camping every year in different uh, national trust properties. And people come from all over the country and from other countries as well to learn various traditional woodland crafts. So I teach there and uh, we've, um, I sort of set up a, or instigated a festival called the Bowl Gathering, which is dedicated purely to um, the wooden bowl. It's, it's three, four, five days in total. So there's pre-fest courses and then a weekend where people can come and share, sh uh, do shorter workshops. But it's all about turning wooden bowls. And um, so that's really thriving at the moment. That's been going for the last three years and every year it's been growing. 
Um, we're not sure if it's going to happen this year because it's due to take place in September. So we're all keeping our fingers crossed. Um, but but w what it does show um, is that, you know, although this is a, this is an endangered craft, there is a lot of interest in it. And, you know, as a result of things like social media, uh, being, people being able to share inspiration, share ideas online all around the world, it's brought this community together. And in the last, you know, when I started turning bowls, there were very few people using a bowl to turn bowls. And now it's, it's, it's um, something which is big enough to have a festival where people come from all around the world, uh, which is great, yeah. We, uh, we managed to fit your lathe into the yurt last year and it was fantastic in drawing people in. It was such a, it's a spectacle as well as being a craft in itself. Um, the, it is, uh, the it is a spectacle, that's a good word, yeah. And I guess that would have been a, a common sight around Britain in days gone past, but it did pretty Absolutely. much die out, didn't it, in the middle of the 20th century? It, 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 it literally died out. Uh, there's a guy called George Laley who was known as the last bowl turner. He's the last person uh, in this country that was using that type of lathe to make bowl production, you know, uh, full time production. Uh, when he died, he was on Bucklebury Common. When he died, the craft died with him. And it wasn't until, um, you know, 20, 30 years later, Robin Wood, who um, was working as a forester at the time, found, went to the Museum of English Rural Life. And you can see George Laley's lathe and his tools there and some of his bowls. And Robin wondered why nobody was doing this anymore, why it had died out and thought it can't be that hard. He learned, taught himself to forge the tools. He built himself a lathe. And then he said it took him about five years just to get the basics because obviously he had nobody to show him and he realized how incredibly difficult it actually is um, to make these simple wooden bowls on a, on a seemingly simple sort of archaic machine. It's a, a, a very complex set of um, things that you need to learn. So um, yeah, it's all really thanks to Robin Wood. He brought the craft back from the dead. Yes. literally which is Robin amazing. is one of our, our founding trustees so he set up the HCA uh, with some other craftspeople and kind of set us on this route of doing the red list and, and profiling endangered crafts and all the heightened awareness that's come with it so yeah it's been a really good legacy of Robin's. Uh, John maybe you could tell us a little bit about your craft and uh, what you're up to at the moment. Yeah sure. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm based in Team Valley, Devon, uh, just on the east edge of Dartmoor. Um, I come from a woodland background, primarily uh, coppice management. So we, myself and my wife, we make a lot of uh, charcoal, which has been very popular. And actually it's been a sort of a nice surprise through the COVID thing that we've been busier than ever with it. So in terms of that as a heritage craft, um, very popular one and a, a good survivor for this uh, for the COVID thing but that the the, the, uh, the stay basket um, I'm trying to think about my where my first awareness came with them really I mean I, I was aware of them in Museum of English Rural Life and there were some links obviously on the um, on the on the Heritage Crafts Association stuff as well um, and I was aware there were a few people making them nationwide but at the time nobody actually in Devon uh, Mark Snellgrove in Cornwall um, and he has the original moulds but apart from that there wasn't actually anybody in Devon which I thought was a bit a bit wrong let we say um, and I'm, I'm having not made a state basket before uh, I got in touch with Mark and spent a few days with him uh, I'm very familiar with the techniques and the processes involved in these baskets so it's, it's a really good thing to be able to put them together uh, and utilise all of that uh, to come up with with these so what you see behind me here are various sizes and the stave basket was traditionally used in Devon around the farm for uh, collecting crops like potatoes apples and the like feeding uh, feeding feeding animals or not um, but with the advent of plastics and uh, primarily plastics actually uh, they, they died out I mean a lot could be said about a majority of coppice crafts uh, with the advent of plastics. So these baskets are now really made as, um, I don't know, collector, collector's items, I guess. I don't make very many. Um, I don't know, I'm probably looking to make 40, 50 a year, something like that. Um, and so it's, and it's a very slow process. I use, um, 
I use a mold like this. You can see it's a replica of the of an 1850 mold, which Mark Snellgrove has. Um, and this is for the size two. And we make a top band similar to that in ash, really good ash. And it's in many ways, it's similar to uh, Sussex Trug, I guess. Um, but we don't know enough about these baskets to know how long they've been around. I mean, Sus Sussex Trugs, I think, made, it, made their entrance into the world 1850 in the Crystal Palace exhibition. Um, but who knows? I mean, the technology for these is, is very similar to sort of just a, a simple bucket, you know, and maybe we were, we were using cleft oak, maybe we were using older, I don't know. These, these are a combination of ash uh, and, and Douglas fir. So bent ash, but not steam bent ash. A lot of people think it's steam bent. It's actually bent green. Um, and so it's seasonal in that, in, in that respect. So fell ash throughout the winter and that might last you three to six months or so of workability. So for me, it fits quite well into my calendar of work. So I'll be charcoaling in the summer and then as soon as September hits, I'll be sort of back on these again, maybe some hedging in the winter. And it, it's been quite interesting for me in terms of a heritage craft, that cultural aspect of it, which is not necessarily looked at in, in the woodland stuff, is, is that seasonality. And so, uh, and how that fits into the rural work, like rural, and even a rural livelihood, rural lifestyle. So... It's, 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 for me, for this COVID-19 business has been quite interesting because I've always tried to look at it in that seasonality. And so, um, so it, there's a resilience there, I think, sometimes that we can learn from in, in a lot of the heritage crafts by not necessarily putting all your eggs into one basket, so to speak. Um, and I, I, I'm quite keen to explore that further. Um, but in terms of the baskets, I'm, uh, there are nine sizes in total, and Mark Snellgrove, who I went to visit, uh, makes this size two, which has a various number of patterns and si uh, um, formers that go with it. Um, I've started to make the larger sizes. This is a huge, great thing here, which is known as a maund. Uh, and when they lose their top handle, like that, and they end up with a side handle, like that on the rim, it becomes a maund. And, um, to my knowledge, I think I'm the only person in the UK making these, um, and I, it's certainly in Devon. Um, there are a few people making the basket, the, the handle baskets, but the um, the Morns, I think I'm the only person. Uh, that requires its own its own um, moulds and all of that sort of thing as well. So I think I've made the only the, the original the only mould since the 1850 originals as well. Um, so made to order. Um, and I'm selling them fairly regularly, actually, sort of fairly trickle, as fast as I can make them anyway. Um, I mean, I could speed up, I could make more moulds, I could start to steam bend, for example, but I, I, I think that's a bit of a deviation from the craft slightly, so I'm quite happy slowly producing to order, really. I mean, they need to stay in their moulds for two weeks, whereas if we were steam bending, we could be churning millions out, you know but it's not quite the way of things with them. It's a, it's a very sort of Devon slow way, really. Um, yeah, that's kind of me, really. And, and what's your route to market? Is it through shows or through your website? Uh, website, social media, you know. Um, Instagram's quite good, I find. Um, li you know, living out in the back of nowhere, as I do, um, I do find that kind of thing very, very useful. Um, you know, I'm quite famous for not leaving this valley, let alone Devon. <laughs> so, um, so I tend to use social media quite a lot and find it very useful. Brilliant. Yeah. Really interesting. Uh, so Beth Gerald, if you, if you could introduce yourself and say a little bit about what you do. Okay. So, um, thanks Daniel. I'm Beth Gerald and, um, we run a small sign making um, handcrafted sign and decorative arts company called um, Dartmoor Sign House. Um, we were here making at the moment um, reverse glass gilded signs and all manner of hand painted signs and 
hand lettering um, pieces. So my background is very much um, hand lettering. So I started off um, sign painting, doing a sign painting apprenticeship about 10 years ago. And from then um, have discovered some really lovely um, methods of making signs and reverse glass gilding being one of the most incredible, I think. And it's, uh, um, I was really drawn to David Smith's work who was in the yurt last year, who I know you're good friends with. And he, yeah, the, just the, the amount of detail and um, exquisite sort of, yeah, his exquisite drawings. And so I've always, whenever I've been doing a project, I've always found myself being drawn to those drawings and Victorian signs. So, um, yeah, so um, combining patterns with old fashioned lettering. Um, Traditional lettering. So, um, yeah, at the moment we make commission, we commission, um, we work on commissions for letters. Um, which is a project we've been doing recently where we've been making some gilded letters um, and yeah we do but all manner of uh, signage as well yeah Brilliant. And it looks like you've got a, a team there Who, who's that behind you so this is Amy Ford this is my dear cousin and um, Amy's been learning for the bus sort of year now and she's fantastic gilder um, it's uh, yeah, Amy's got a craft background as well in glass blowing, so it's kind of lends itself, um, yeah, working with glass and a love for lettering as well. So we've decided to join forces and, yeah, create something new. And, um, yeah, so we're making, yeah, these, we're working on these letters that you can see in the background at the moment, um, which are oil gilded and water gilded. So water gilding creates the amazing um, mirror finish on the letters and then the oil gilding, which is the glowing gold, which I'll show you actually, easy to explain. I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, but you can, there's a bit of, there's a mirror finish there and a, um, the glowing gold in the center, which you can manipulate a little bit after you've laid it. Um, yeah, for different effects. And then there's some color blend blending, but what the glass does is it, gives us in this lovely finish with the solid colours and background. Um, yeah. And do you sell at shows and things as well as through your website? Um, we've been, we haven't done any shows as of yet. Um, I've never done a show, which I, I, I would like to at some point. Um, I've moved down, just moved back to Devon from London. So I've just been painting more fascias than anything so lots of um shop fronts and windows in situ but we yeah we're now trying to go down a route more of sort of fine art pieces and signs that are accessible to everyone so if someone wants to order a sign for a birthday or for a for a baby being born or um to collect a series of letters um yeah that's what we'd like to be doing and what we're working towards brilliant Okay, um, it's been really interesting to hear what you've all got to say. I just wondered if there was anything that had cropped up, any thoughts from hearing each other talk or any questions you'd like to ask each other? I'd like to ask a question, Daniel, and that's um, uh, one of the things I really like about letterpress printing is there's lots of uh, phrases that have come into kind of common parlance. So things like, I've just written a few down, so mind your P's and Q's is one. Um, so in less press, um, basically everything's back to front, much like sign writing on glass, I guess. So a P, if you pick a P, a P up, it's basically prints as a Q, which is, so that's where mind your P's and Q. And there's also out of sorts is another one. So every letter in a, in a case of type is a sort. So if you, if you're working for two hours and you run out of letter T's, that's, you're a bit kind of fed up and it's being out of sorts. So, I wondered if there were any in other people's crafts um, uh, that that have, have come into sort of common use um, in different ways. An obvious one I can think of for um, pole lathe turning is bodger, because the um, they weren't bowl turners using pole lathes were never called bodgers. It was the um, the the people that used to camp out in the woods in the Chilterns who used to make chair legs 
they were known as bodgers. They would they would make their camps in the summer and spend the summer turning um, chair legs. Oh, the winter, sorry, turning chair legs. And um, they became known as bodgers. They were highly skilled craftsmen, really highly skilled. And, and it's interesting that the word bodger has become um, used as you know to, to sort of uh, talk about somebody who's doing a bad job or something, <laughs> which I find interesting. I wonder why that that change happened in the meaning. I was... I've um, I've heard once or twice that that comes from the fact that there, there a lot of bodgers were working piecemeal, so they wouldn't necessarily complete the whole job. You'd have a stack of legs or a stack of stretchers and that kind of thing left in the woods, so you wouldn't necessarily fulfil the whole task, regardless of the fact they were obviously extremely talented. It was it was that ne they didn't actually ever do the whole job. They never made the whole chair. Just it's just something I'd heard once or twice. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That would make sense. That's exactly what they did. And then the chair legs would get sent off to the factories in High Wycombe and they'd assemble the chairs there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rebecca, there's probably lots of terms in clock and watch making that are quite specialist, <laughs> but maybe not made their way into common parlance. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about it. I mean, there's loads of like, origins of words I find really interested in watch and clock making, like clock itself. The word clock comes from the Latin, uh, medieval Latin for bell, because the original clocks only had a bell, they didn't have a dial. So clock means bell. So little things like that. Uh, hour from Horus, the god of uh, day and night. So our word for hour now is from the ancient Egyptian. So the things like that, but I can't, I'm trying, it, that, you caught me off guard with that one. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Think, what? What? Yeah. Have a think about it. I'll have to have a think. <laughs> <laughs> I'll email in after. As soon as we hang up, something will come to me. <laughs> Ellie from sign writing, I'm sure there's a whole lexicon associated with it. That uh... yeah, I discovered the other day that um, that um, pub, a lot of pub signs, the the names of pubs are actually derived from the pub sign rather than the the name of the pub, so that they they would have had a swing sign with a a red line, which would have drawn certain men on horses into the pub, and then that they ended up naming the pub after the sign rather than. The, which was interesting but yeah and I guess at one point um literacy would have been a lot less so people would have gone by the sign rather than the, the written name yeah. yeah okay um I was, I was gonna say I've noticed uh, in a recent report by the Crafts Council uh, on their on the market for craft they said um the biggest motivation for those who already buy craft uh, was the desire to keep craft skills alive and the admiration of the human skill involved in making. Uh, I was wondering if uh, anyone finds that people are appreciating not just the craft object, but the skill that went into making it a bit more nowadays than maybe in the past. I, I, I think that's right. I think anybody that's bought a basket from me has actually stated that one of the reasons was they were very keen that you know that they, 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 they wanted to keep the skills alive that's that has definitely been a a factor in in the deciding you know they fall for them but then they also fall for for the for, the, for what's yeah but what's going on behind that as well and it's you know i think anybody would be sad to think that these things are going to die out mm -hmm. um so to, to, to help it, it's a bigger picture it's a bigger story i guess from my view Definitely. And I would agree with that as well. And um, I think it's interesting the way that traditional craftspeople who um, you take, for example, what I do, you know, I don't need any connection to anything, any electricity whatsoever. It's a really old age craft. But some of the people, you know, people who are, who are good at selling in the Greenwood work world and making a, a good job of, you know, earning most of their income from selling online what they're doing is they're using social media platforms to create a story mm. about um you know over over a period of time and especially people who are not really new to the scene but who have been doing it for sort of six or seven years and, and are adept at what they're doing but still in a way very much at the beginning of their journey in some senses and what what they do which is really interesting is share that story of how they're learning and the obstacles and the stumbling blocks um 
and people see that development happening and understand then how challenging it is and share their sort of victories and successes as they go along that journey mm. and really sort of feel like they've been traveling that path with the, the maker. And so that understanding of what skill is required is very, very deep then in that sense. Um, and I think, yeah, people, people are really using that as a tool, a marketing tool quite consciously, um, you know, to, uh, with great results. And it, so, yeah, I think that definitely is true. I think it's probably always been the case to a certain extent that you don't sell the object out of context. There's always the narrative behind it. That's part yeah. of part of the offer as well. So in that case, maybe it's, it's not a new thing, but maybe people are just more interested now in the story that goes behind it and more appreciative of the value. And I guess if they know the, the effort and the, the, the journey that the craftsperson's got to to get to that stage where they can produce this, then they've got a better appreciation of the monetary value of the object as well, compared with something that's maybe made in a low wage economy, mass produced abroad and, and shipped in. Um, yeah, I think understanding in that respect has become slightly more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think also, I was going to say sometimes you get family connections. So with us, we get people come in who, um, whose and their grandfather was a typographer or, um, you know, set type by hand. And so I really like that thing when there are kind of connections, family connections, and and people are wanting to kind of have some understanding of what their, um, you know, grandparents or great grandparents did and, and, and how, how their, you know, how their craft, how their skills happened. So I think that's an interesting one. I, um, I sold two baskets in particular in the autumn last year and uh, a Devon basket in Devon and, and a lady, an elderly lady there, she zoned in on it I uh, hadn't seen one for years and she remembered using them in the fields with the harvesting potatoes and she fell at head over heels with it and, and she wanted one obviously and I thought oh my god she's gonna the price of this is gonna knock her over because she's she'll have used to using these tattered old things in the fields these old things and she bought one and she in fact she bought two and she bought one for her daughter because she wanted to ha her daughter to have one and she wanted to pass that story on of the times that she had had at harvest time as a girl with her family and all of that emotional connection seemed to come rolling back and she wanted to pass it on to her daughter and for me that was just an amazing thing and i i think i'm in, it, it, that had a lot to do with the locality of selling selling a devon basket in devon people can remember them and it's such a lovely thing to have that connection uh, blew me away that one it's really good that's wonderful and i think we had a lot of that in the yurt last year people coming in and saying my grandfather was a woodworker or a printer or you know, some relationship to the family it's a really nice point of connection that they can then explore the background yeah. a little bit more um i was just wondering um if kind of knowing your craft is endangered is that changed the way you think about it or the way you go about things? Anyone got any thoughts on that? Um, for me, I got, I do feel a little bit of responsibility in the right way, I guess. And the only thing I've got to guide me on that for, is the, the last maker in Devon, a chap called Jack Rousel was in Tiverton and he gave an interview to the Museum of English Rural Life which I have a transcript of, and in there, there are some really juicy bits. Um, and that's really all I've got. But uh, so I try to stick as close as I can to that um, with a view to passing it on. It's, it's that thing where I don't want to steam bend them because if I steam bend them, I know I can use a slightly thicker material and that isn't true to it because that changes the aesthetic. Um, and so I wouldn't, so it's, it's little tips and tricks like that, which, I, which are in the little interview. Uh, which I try to stick to because I, I guess yeah, it's a responsibility, isn't it? It's if if as a designer maker designing your own product, you can do whatever you want with it. It's your thing and it's new. 
but if it's something that's been passed down is it you know is it your responsibility to do right by it whoever copies you or whoever you teach i guess yeah definitely i think there's a, a part of that um there's a craftsperson i was speaking to and she'd never really um uh, confronted the fact that her craft was endangered even though it obviously was um, but kind of working with us through the red list and and kind of made her think about this issue a bit more and I think it did become a kind of a, a, a weight of responsibility in terms of keeping <laughs> that craft alive hopefully in a positive way we wouldn't want it to weigh on anyone's shoulders too heavily um, but in terms of passing her skills on, she'd always um, thought in the back of her mind that one day she'd want to take on an apprentice, um, but it just didn't fit in with her way of working at the moment. But I think she's thinking a bit more seriously now about how she's going to pass on those skills for the next generation. I think, um, sorry, with the, I was just going to say with the sign writing and the um, gilded windows as well, it's about um, having them out there for people to see and you, you see a lot um, a lot more in London and in the cities but down in the southwest and um, yeah they would I mean the the, the streets um, would have always had beautifully gilded shop front windows and pharmacies you still see a few pharmacies around with these incredible um, glass panels outside and I think it's about having them visible to people and then for people to know yeah for people to know about how they're made and especially for um, for for younger people as well to to know that it's a something that goes on and something that they could perhaps look into or yeah it's, it, it's, for me it took a long time to even discover it you know to to find my journey there so yeah I think it's important to have it visible because it's yeah eye catching. <laughs> And on that note, I was going to ask each of you what advice would you give somebody wanting to take take up the craft, your particular craft? Uh, so I don't know who wants to kick off on that. Nick? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, I think with what we do, I think it's finding your sort of unique take on it. Um, and and um, it's, it feels sort of quite broad, you know, so for example, we do a lot of collaboration. I really enjoy working with other people, with artists, with poets, with with musicians. And that that's like, I, I just sort of love that thing of working with other different kind, different things. And that's become, our, I think, our thing really. So we, we've, we've just done a, in lockdown, we did a project with Richard Long, the sculptor, and um, and I cycled out and delivered the prints to him. Um, so, so, so I would say that's the thing to sort of find something that you love about that craft and work at that rather than sort of trying to kind of um, envelop the whole thing or, or be very general. I, I think you need to find the specific thing that you love about that craft, uh, whatever that is. And how would somebody go about kind of getting the, the basic skills is it short courses or is there any such thing as an apprenticeship in let, letterpress uh there is i mean ellen who works with me has been here six years and she has um done a, a, as near as to an apprenticeship as i can imagine uh, i think there's probably different ways i mean um art colleges are, are desperately trying to get letterpress equipment back into colleges um, that they gave away or, or melted down 30 years ago. Um, so, you know, there are colleges um, that are, are, are doing, you know, Plymouth is a good example. That's a really good letterpress department. So you can learn, begin to learn through being at university. Um, Swansea is another example. But um, but then, yeah, we, we run work, we did run workshops. So we've got to kind of work out another, a new way of, of running workshops. So a lot of people come here and do a day course or an evening class over five weeks. And some people have, have come, we have this group called the um, Type Maniacs who have, have kind of have their own evening and they've just been coming back and run their own projects. So in, in a way, I think there's lots of different ways, I would say, of coming into this particular thing. 
Re Rebecca, what's the, what's the route into watchmaking if there is one? Yeah, um, well, there are several different routes, and I think the most important thing is that there's no right or wrong way to learn from what I've seen. So you can do courses. There's a br brilliant kind of foundation course in Manchester. Um, that leaves you with the basic kind of skill set, but it's something that takes a very long time to learn. So it's a question of just patience and perseverance more than anything. But at the same time, I've met some incredible watchmakers who are virtually entirely self-taught. And I met others who um, just went straight into the workplace and did an apprenticeship and started out that way too. So there's several different ways to go about it. I think it's about finding what works for your style of learning and uh, for your life as well you know it's not always suitable for everyone to just give up everything and go back to college or university so I think that's really important and um, to not be scared of making mistakes as well which kind of touches slightly back on the last question about finding out the crafting dangers is um, for watchmaking it's such I mean this is a global multi-billion dollar industry and yet its foundation is now endangered because everything has gone into CNC and mass production. So the skills that actually brought the subject to be have gone. And because of that, certainly I felt very scared of things like social media of actually showing how I'm making things because you look to the competition who are huge and massive companies and everything's CNC clinical clean, everything's perfect, everything's been photoshopped within an inch of its life. And you think, oh, where do I fit in with them and all that? Um, and then it's kind of finding out things like this that I've, me and Craig just decided, you know what, no one else is showing making things. So we're just going to put that out there and you're going to see lots of oily lathes and dirty hands and piles of swarth and blood, sweat and tears. And that's because that's how we actually do it. And um, I think, yeah, don't be scared of making mistakes. Don't be scared of showing that side of things. And social media is actually a really good way to learn because as you show people how you're doing things, you get other people commenting and suggesting different, we have people commenting different kinds of cutter and things that they've used and has worked really well and then you can incorporate that. And so yeah, I think find out how it works for you and then just be open about it and share it and don't be scared about not getting it right first time. I think that goes back to what we were saying before about selling the narrative as much as the craft object. People like like to see the story behind it. And I think in terms of sharing your skills, I think in the past, a lot of uh, craftspeople and tradespeople have been very closed off about sharing their skills because there's been a threat that people will set up in competition and, sh and steal their market share or whatever. I think that was probably more the case when these crafts were more common. Uh, I think now that they're maybe more endangered, the, the market opportunities out there are, are huge. So and it, if you share your skills with somebody, it's not going to th threaten your, your part of the, the marketplace. And, and we tend to find that the, the craftspeople that are more open and inviting, that have a kind of open door policy in their workshop, allowing people to come in and see what they're doing. And they're using social media to share their techniques and uh, engage in a dialogue with people who are either learning or maybe retired craftspeople, um, they tend to be the ones that are more successful because more people are engaging with them, their stories getting out there further, and that's got a knock-on effect on boosting their sales. Um, Sh Sharif, what's the, what's the route into pole lathe bowl turning? Is it, is it uh, on an amateur basis to begin with? Uh, absolutely needs to be really because it takes it does take quite a long time to develop the skills to a level where you can um, produce work quickly enough to make it financially viable um, which is not to say that different people learn some people learn more quickly than others um, but the, the first thing that I would suggest ideally if you can get to a course with somebody the good thing now is that there are quite a few people teaching bowl bowl turning on a pole lathe all over the country so whether you're in the north of the country the south east or west you'll be able to find someone nearby relatively close to you where you can get some tuition um, and you can do that just by searching online pole lathe bowl turning courses um, some of the people that are teaching advertise on a website called craft courses um, so that's a good way to look for that the other thing I would recommend people to do is to join the APTGW, which is the Association of Pole Lathe Turners and Green Woodworkers of Great Britain. Um, subscribe to, to that association, become a member, 
and um, every region will have a local group, a, bowl, uh, a green woodworking group. So you can connect with people in your area um, and learn more about traditional green woodworking. A lot of those regions will have at least one or two people that have become interested in bowl, bowl turning using a pole lathe. So that's another good way to, to connect with people. Um, if you can't get to courses, I would recommend that there are some videos online, like I've made this video with a guy called Zed, Zed Outdoors. It's a very long, very detailed uh, beginner's guide to pole lathe bowl turning. So um, that's another thing that people could check out. Uh, and just be prepared to, um, you know, not to let the, the other bit of advice, not just practical advice on how to how to get in there, but just advice for learning any traditional craft is to be patient and, you know, be gentle with yourself because, um, you know, it is a, it's a journey that you should enjoy every step of the way, even the stumbling blocks. And there'll be lots of those. And just, just to approach learning a craft with that sort of mindset that it's a, a long haul journey, which never ends. I mean, I don't feel like I've arrived. I've been doing this sort of 11 years, 12 years now, and I'm still learning as I go. And I think that's the same for most people. Uh, but especially at the beginning, it can feel very, it can feel at times like you're just never going to get anywhere with it. So just to, you know, just to sort of stick with it and be patient and uh, a little bit, a little bit often and you'll get there. Great. And John, I guess it's a little bit different with the stave baskets and that all the other crafts represented here were done by specialists, where, whereas I think this was probably done as a sideline by farmers and agricultural workers. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's it was a wet weather job sideline thing. I mean, it's interesting, though, because, you know, I've been a coppice worker and greenwood worker as well for some time. And uh, it's a surprising amount of skill that goes into one of these. Um, it's a combination of skills that you, you can't pick up overnight uh, and it tests you, tests you every time. Everyone's different slightly. And um, I mean, I would echo Sharif really in terms of that, that training thing, the training methods. Uh, approach one of us, you know. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in sharing. I think these things have been coveted for far too long and when they're at this level of endangeredness, um it's uh it's unfair not to share so you know social media and stuff i try and do all sorts of stuff and if anyone approaches me uh, i'm more than happy uh to, to 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 share um you know with stave basket kind of thing a short course great i mean i'm looking to possibly do some courses next year um in the past people have approached me and i help them out when i can ad hoc basis but probably looking at doing something a bit more formalized this coming year um with the stave basket the, the the process starts in the woods i mean you're looking at a tree as it's standing and deciding whether it's going to make one and there are differences between the tree that's, that will make one and a tree that won't and so the process starts in the woods um, and so there's that level of knowledge which starts there and ends here uh, and all manner of things in between. Um, so it's not an overnight process, but I think pretty much all of us are probably approachable uh, in that way. But a short course is a great thing as an introductory level type thing, I would say. And Beth, how does somebody go about getting into the craft of sign writing? Um, I would say um, one, I think one of the most important things you can learn is the Roman lettering, traditional Roman trade and letters, maybe in the proportions of those letters. Um, and then, yeah, then it's about getting yourself some brushes and having a go and trying to figure out which brushes lend themselves to which scripts and um, which hands. And there are, there are so many amazing courses out there from um, circus um, circus style painting to wagon painting to um, or courses just on Roman lettering so um, yeah I think have a practice with the brush really get used to using the brushes and then um, yeah see what what avenue you want to go down there are some amazing modern painters as well and graphic designers who have come from a graphic design background and they're now painting by hand onto walls and um, yes it's about what you want what kind of angle you want to come from and then with reverse glass gilding I'd say 
Um, there are some fantastic books. I might send you a picture of one because I was just looking around thinking, where is it? But I can send that to you after maybe. But um, the the methods haven't really changed since the Victorian time. So there, a lot of it you can find in books. And yeah, I, mean, I was lucky enough to do a course with Dave a few years ago, an intensive course. Um, Dave Smith, David Smith, who um, I think is probably one of the most respected guilders out there. So if you can go on courses and then there's loads of videos online um but yeah there's there's so much out there it's just having a go and seeing finding your sort of flavor <laughs> yeah i think with the case of a lot of these crafts it's a case of uh, kind of a portfolio training short mm -hmm. courses workshops and practice rather than a kind of a yeah. sustained apprenticeship which would have maybe been the, the original um, yeah definitely they're not out there sadly anymore the training in in schools and colleges but um but yeah practice i think with lettering and brush skills is practice is it's so easy to get to run ahead which i've definitely done um <laughs> before but yeah but always go back to the basics and like the the roman lettering and the proportions of those letters is is yeah you can once you have that you can take them so far yeah <laughs> I think we're coming towards the end now, but before we wrap up, is there anything anyone would like to raise or any questions that have cropped up you'd like to uh, mention? If not, that's fine. <clears throat> we haven't talked about the, well, I don't know whether we should talk about it really, but just how the last kind of 12 weeks have affected everyone in, in their particular crafts and how they sort of dealt with it and coped with it. Yeah, that would be good. Do you want to kick off and then Nick? Yeah, I mean, here we're in a, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we're in a cooperative building that was set up as a craft co-op in the 1970s. Um, <clears throat> and they, they um, got a grant which has paid our rent for free because, you know, half our income was through workshops. So we immediately lost half our income. Um, and it's been interesting, the, the thing of really trying to quickly adapt to working in a different way. You know, we've, we've tried to produce more work and put in a shop online. And we've talked a lot about social media and um, stuff. So, and, you know, it's surprisingly worked quite well. We've always been rubbish at selling stuff, um, or I have. Um, and, and suddenly it's kind of worked. And I don't know whether it is because people want to help us and want to kind of keep us going which i think is definitely part of it so it's been a really interesting time you know in sort of changing the way we we, we operate and work here i think it, it's been mixed for a lot of crafts people we we've um, we did a survey earlier in the lockdown showing that over 50 percent of crafts people had serious doubts about whether their businesses would survive six months uh, and we, as, as a result, we set up a small grant scheme and able to give out some some small amounts of money to help people and um, maybe kind of reframe what they do or set themselves on a slightly new path that would kind of better suit their business to the new economic landscape, whatever that's going to be. Uh, but we've also found that some crafts have actually benefited in a strange way from the situation. So we, we've been talking to uh, Mill Wright and he's been rushed off his feet working on uh, traditional uh, windmills because uh, people have been home baking and uh, the demand for specialist organic flowers and local varieties of flowers skyrocketed. So they, they've got a lot of work in, in putting these mills back into use which has been really interesting. As, as I think I said earlier, we make a lot of charcoal and that's been a really nice surprise through this. Um, we've produced probably, we've produced half by now, uh, what we produced all of last season and we still got three or four months to go. So we're looking to probably double what we produced last season it kicked off immediately as soon as almost the day of the lockdown now the phone was ringing and orders were coming in it, i mean it's been the per it may not have been so good if the weather wasn't so good but for us as charcoal producers it's kind of been the perfect storm where everybody's been at home and the weather's been absolutely amazing and our stockists have remained open because they're also food stockists farm shops and so it's just been flying out um so we're, we're very pleased with that and um, and i think 
you know, I think a lot of it in terms of the resilience factor is, is that because we cover quite a lot of bases with the we charcoal, we go that way, and then with the baskets, we go that way, and we also do all sorts of bits and bobs. And that one has just kind of won out on this, really. So, in terms of yeah, we're we're, we're very happy with with that. Brilliant. Okay, um, it uh, just leaves me to thank you all for taking part. It's been really fan fantastic and really fascinating discussion. And it's not quite the same as all being together in the yurt, but hopefully it's, it's the next best thing. And, and uh, next year when the, all this is over, we can all get together and uh, enjoy being in the yurt together. Uh, so I'll just wrap up by saying uh, thank you for joining us in the Digital Yurt of Endangered Crafts as part of the Digital Craft Festival.